Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, Rick Tolman with um, uh, ACAP here at UAF. And so um, I have been asked to talk. I'm gonna just going to stick with the kind of the uh, air climate part and let uh, uh, Phyllis and Jim are going to do the um, do the uh, uh, ocean climate uh, part. So um, March through June. Well, we got to start in March. Um, March was one of the greatest uh, uh, climate uh, anomalies in uh, in Alaska history. This is the mean uh, temperature degree F departure from normal. Uh, everything in the pinks or reds was uh, the warmest March of record, and uh, many places was had the warmest March of record by many degrees. You can see uh, along the Bering Sea coast, uh, um, every, basically everywhere north of Bristol Bay. Uh, was the warmest of record, and that extended a, into the Chukchi and Beaufort. Really just a phenomenal, phenomenal month. This was when um, places on the North Slope had daily departures from normal um, in excess of 40 degrees at the tail end of the month. Uh, since then, uh, it has remained uh, very warm. Um, hope you can see this. This is just April, May, and then June, uh, showing the uh, the monthly mean temperature departures around the state. Um, there's been a big bullseye centered uh, around Kotzebue Sound with um, incredibly early loss of ice there and the historical climate, of course, dominated by ice uh, through, um, through May and even into June. Um, really spectacularly large anomalies, but you can see that um, all across uh, the Bering Sea region every month uh, persistently uh, very warm from the Pribilofs um, and, and Eastern Aleutians all the way uh, north. Very um, uh, just sustained uh, extreme weather uh, or extreme uh, temperatures. Uh, putting it all together, uh, spring temperatures. Um, this is using uh, my colleague Brian Brett Schneider's um, ranking uh, software. Uh, so I, what I've got here for you, three different uh, analyses of the March through May temperature ranks. The fire engine red is uh, would be the warmest of record. On the left, from uh, Berkeley Earth, uh, ranking since uh, 2000. I'm sorry, since 1900. Uh, the the blue there would be null values. Um, in the middle is from NASA GIS. Um, again, uh, you can see large areas of the, nearly the entire uh, Bering Sea in this uh, analysis uh, ranks as the warmest spring since, uh, since 1900 and most of mainland Alaska as well. And then on the uh, right-hand side, uh, the uh, NCEP-NCAR reanalysis um, only starting in 1949 here. But uh, of course, uh, for uh, the Bering Sea and most of mainland Alaska singing exactly the same picture, uh, March uh, through May 2019, really um, uh, the warmest of record, and really except for uh, a couple of springs, mostly 2016, um, nothing quite like it. And um, so I get at that in this time series here. So this is for the Western Alaskan Climate Division. That's that area, extends from Point Hope south to uh, Kuskokwim Bay and um, the data since 1925. And this is a really interesting time series. This is just the uh, March through June, so four month uh, mean annual temperature for that region. Uh, this year was, uh, as you can see, uh, by far the uh, warmest of record. Um, this is, um, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in here. First of all, um, there, you, there is no sign of a PDO shift in uh, 19, uh, 76. Um, the uh, the break point there is in uh, 1989, and um, not only is the mean higher, notice the, um, the the strong decrease in interannual variability uh, post the uh, 1989. Um, there hasn't been a cold uh, four month March through June, not a top ten since uh, the mid 80s. But notice the warmest. Um, are not clustered uh, in the uh, the um, very recent times, uh, practically a one a decade there, uh, extending back into the early 20s, the, although three of the last uh, four springs are in the top 10. So really um, quite an interesting time series here, but again, showing really how dramatic the last few years uh, have been relative to um, uh, history.
And uh, the last slide that I have for you, just uh, we're going to zoom out a little bit. And um, so this is the, uh, the broader uh, uh, Arctic view here. Again, uh, March through June, um, average temperature departures a little bit above the surface here. So uh, a little bit smoother field. But uh, the important uh, thing to notice here, first of all, everywhere around Alaska the last four months, uh, significantly warmer than the 1981 to 2010 normals and uh, very strong anomalies, not only across the, the Bering Sea and mainland Alaska, but extending up uh, into, the, uh, into the high Arctic um, uh, on the Pacific side. So really quite, quite dramatic, but uh, it is not, um, it is not uh, in any sense uh, uh, confined to Alaska or Bering Sea representing, uh, as we all know, uh, what's um, uh, or an extreme version of what's happening across the uh, Arctic. Um, so with, if, unless there's any questions, that's what I got for you. Thank you so much, Rick. Does anyone have any questions really quickly? Kelly, this is Amy. Rick, if people want to keep up with this type of information, where should they go? What should they do? What are you putting out there and how can they find it? Um, so Brian Brett Schneider and I, um, Brian uh, here at uh, here at IARC, um, we're both very active on Twitter, and I in particular really strongly focus on what's happening around Alaska, uh, whether well, particularly climate-wise, uh, atmosphere and ocean. Um, that's a good place. Uh, also, um, the ACAP uh, website and our we climate uh, and weather highlights tool. Uh, we try to uh, try to keep that up with um, notable events as well. I, I have a question. Um, you did a good job of showing us uh, in the Alaska, in the previous plots, that this warmth in Alaska is, you know, pretty unprecedented. But, um, but with regard to this, this. Oh, you froze, Michael. Yeah, it's, it's all red, but I just, uh, I'd love to know more about like how anomalous it, it was uh, and for the big picture as well. For, are you referring to the slide that's up now, the time series? No, the, the, the next one, the last, your last plot. Oh, um, yeah. well, to some extent, um, get it, get it that through, through these here. Uh, so this is the rankings. Um, so the fire engine red is the warmest in the period of record used. Um, we could, we could expand this out, although the reanalyses, the, the NASA and the Berkeley have uh, more missing data in the uh, high Arctic, but uh, you can see extending north of Alaska on the uh, NSEP NCAR reanalysis starting in 1949. Again, a lot of that analyzed as the warmest of record in that um, in that 71 year period. Yeah, yeah, that, that's great, and I and I would just love to see that for the whole domain. But yeah, that's that yeah, because that's fantastic. Okay, um, thanks so much, Rick. Um, so up next, we're gonna have Phyllis Stabenow and uh, Jim Oberlin. So Phyllis, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen. Is it going to work? It, it is working. Looks good. <laughs> have to, uh... <laughs> I have no faith in computer technology. It's a miracle for me. <laughs> no worries. Okay. Okay. So um, we're Jim and I are going to focus more on. Uh, a second, Phyllis. What? Uh, if you go to display settings at the top of your screen. <laughs> and hit uh, the down arrow and just switch your display. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Looks good. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, Jim and I are gonna talk more about the ocean. Uh, this first slide uh, talks shows uh, figures of ice. Um, the 2019 um, ice was fairly normal into January, and then very strong winds out of the south 
uh, forced it, an extensive retreat. 2018 um, ice uh, was more, uh, was low almost the whole year, um, almost record breaking. Um, shown on the left is ice extent, maximum ice extent with the date. And you can see how uh, the 2018 is particularly low. One of the remarkable things here is if you look at maximum ice extent, was 2012, that was the largest on some statistics of ice extent. Six years later, we had the lowest ice extent. So there's a lot of instability or a lot of variability in this system. Uh, shown in the bottom left is the cold pool. And the cold pool structures the Bering Sea Shelf. It's important as a barrier for uh, you know, adult subarctic fishes, and you know, it's also a refuge for young of the year pollock um, and zooplankton, and uh, it's a corridor for Arctic species being able to come south. So it's a really important thing for the ecosystem of the uh, Bering Sea. If we go to this next plot, Bering Sea is divided into two parts, the northern Bering Sea Shelf, southeastern, and the southeastern Bering Sea Shelf in the south. We have a series of moorings. On um, this bottom one, this circle, this M2, there's 25 years of data here. Um, and this is just one part of it. Uh, this is the average temperature in the upper, in the red, at that site. And you can see the huge variability we have in years where you have low ice extent. Uh, your temperatures are much warmer, extensive ice, temperatures, depth average temperatures are much colder. Um, the highest or warmest uh, year so far was 2016, and you can see it's at the end of three successive years, which each became warmer. Uh, the lower plot is uh, shows data uh, now and for 2019. Uh, yesterday, 2019's depth average temperature at M2 is, reached the same thing as we saw in 2016. So this is a quarter of a century of data and this year is now tied with uh, 16 as the warmest yeah, water temperature. So why, why, sorry, so why? And I think there's a couple of reasons we need to look at. Uh, first of all, uh, showing the upper Phyllis, I think we lost you. Can you hear us now? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, so upper left is uh, ice extent in February, March, and April. You can see it's pretty stable up through about uh, 2015 when you begin to see a decline. The vertical bluish lines are indications of when you have at least a 31-day period of winds out of the south, which are warm. And before 2015, maybe it happened once every four or five years. But in the last three years, there has been at least one month long period where the mean winds are out of the south and they're very warm. Uh, another reason that I think we're seeing less ice in the uh, Bering Sea is because of uh, plot on the right, the Chukchi has to freeze before the Bering Sea can freeze. And this is the day of ice arrival. Uh, you can see this uh, slope in the southern Chukchi uh, when you have 80, more than 80% ice has been, uh, that has been coming later and later. Finally, the two lines have intersected. And so this, I think, is contributing to the delay of ice arrival in the north. So what are the implications um, uh, about less ice? One of them is Rick's uh, plot here, which is sea surface temperature in the north. 
uh, Northern Bering Sea. Uh, the map is up in the upper left of that panel. And you can see, once again, the very warm sea surface temperatures, especially in the last couple of years that we're seeing. In the lower right is M8, that's the northern mooring uh, in the Bering Sea. Uh, there's about 14 years of data here. The red line at the bottom is the mean bottom temperatures. And you can see um, historically, basically they stay below minus one throughout the summer. Uh, but in 2018, the blue line, the temperatures have increased markedly three and a half degrees above normal. And this is the bottom temperature, which is not warming as rapidly because of uh, heating or anything. This is, is the complexity of the structure, vertical structure on this shelf, and it's changed. And so you're now warming the cold pool in the bottom. Um, 2019 um, is there. It's not as warm as 2018, uh, but it is still well above the long-term average. Thank you. Jim now will continue. Yeah, so uh, looking at, at the causality here, uh, we're, we're seeing two parts. One, as Phil has said, is the delay of freeze up and thin ice sets the stage and we think we'll have that uh, every year going forward. Uh, the other one is uh, how do we get these southerly winds and this is a, a plot of the jet stream for winter. The wind direction follows the contours and you can see the wind coming from the southwest over the Bering Sea very strongly, but then it dives down uh, and, and made it very cold on the east coast. Uh, this, this large pattern has to do with the polar vortex moving off of the North Pole and moving over uh, Greenland and then that backs up the wavy jet stream over uh, Alaska. So the, the proximate cause of the southerly winds is actually the large scale uh, atmospheric flow. And uh, we've seen this pattern now, this is the second year in a row, uh, we consider that the setup of the jet stream ought to be fairly random, so uh, we're kind of flummoxed on uh, why we've had it two years in a row, but the, the take home message here is it's not just a heat stories issue uh, in the Bering Sea or Alaska, that, that what we're seeing in the Bering Sea is, is tied to the whole North American uh, weather pattern this winter. So that's it for me. Thanks so much, Jim. Uh, Phyllis, we had one question on the chat. For the Northern Bering Sea slide, how is day of ice arrival defined? Uh, is ice arrival defined as less, is greater than 15% concentration at ice edge, or is there a different definition? No, uh, the plot shown now um, is when the ice became greater than 20% at a box around M8, uh, a 50 kilometer by 50 kilometer box. Gotcha, thank you for that. Um, are there any other questions? Southwest of uh, St. Lawrence. Just southwest of St. Lawrence, okay. Yeah. It's in the map. Gotcha, um, and I'll be sure to post these slides afterward if that's okay with you, Phyllis. I know this is still in press. No, it's in press. Okay. I just did the galleys. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, okay, are there any other questions really quickly? All right, um, next we're t we'll turn to Ali Deary from Alaska Fisheries Science Center. Okay, let me do the screen. 
Okay, is that up for everybody? Uh, no. Okay. There you are. All right, how about now? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, yeah, thank you, Kelly. So I'm going to give a brief fisheries update for not just in, uh, Bering Sea, but also kind of up into the Arctic, focusing on the Chukchi Sea. Um, so it's great that, you know, Phyllis uh, and uh, Rick have already talked before, so we already have an understanding of kind of the physical changes that we're seeing. Chiefly among them is um, these decreasing sea ice, um, which the, the graph here is showing that from the start of this record in 1979, we're seeing um, an increase in the number of days with an ice concentration below 30%. Uh, and this has been persisting uh, into kind of the more uh, recent years. Uh, Phyllis showed this kind of interlink between the, the southern Chukchi and the northern Bering Sea in that if there's a delay in the onset of sea ice in the Chukchi. That really is what's setting the ability of the northern Bering Sea to freeze, which later impacts the formation of this um, cold pool structure. And then also just in this bottom, uh, reminding ourselves that again, in the these most recent years, the last six years have been the, la the six warmest years on record, um, according to the sea surface temperature. So again, we're seeing a lot of warming in this area, and this has implications for, for the biology. And so to give some more real-time data, now shifting kind of from that March to June time frame to what we've been seeing uh, currently, this is a bottom temperature profile from the collected from the ground fish assessment survey that's currently out there sampling, and this is updated as of July 9th uh, of this year. And so I just remind you the cold pool is a feature of water that's two degrees Celsius or less. And really what I want to emphasize is that in the areas that have been sampled so far, we see a lot of these warmer temperatures and these kind of fire engine red, burnt orange colors. And really we're, we're not really seeing a cold pool where we sample yet. We're just south of St. Lawrence Island is where the um, survey ended as of July 9th. So there's still time to maybe detect a cold pool, but kind of to emphasize again is that most of this area is seeing really uh, is seeing higher bottom temperatures. A lot of this red instead of these kind of more greens, bluish greens. Uh, the areas in white uh, are the part of the survey grid that have yet to be done in the eastern Bering Sea, and then this darker gray sh shaded boxes represent uh, this northern Bering Sea extension that's going to be sampled. Uh, in August of this year. So just giving you kind of the preview of where the bottom trawl of the ground fish group is going next for assessing adult fish populations, as well as collecting some of this bottom temperature information. So kind of now with the, the physical background, um, oops. sorry, uh, I want to touch base on what we're seeing in some of the fish trends. First, starting the early life history stages. And so these are trends that we're seeing in our larval fish community uh, from 2010 to 2017. And this analysis was done by a postdoc in our group, Esther Goldstein. And for those of you that had been part of the meeting uh, earlier in the week, you've seen this slide. But essentially what I want to emphasize is that this is a list of taxa that were included in the analysis. They were present at more than 2.5% of the stations. And they're basically oriented from those that are more or less Arctic species to those at the bottom of the list that are have similar distributions more to the south, or what you could consider more boreal species. And the color of the dots in each of these maps, uh, the Arctic species are denoted by a more uh, Arctic-dominated ichthyoplankton or laurel fish community, whereas the dots that are in the more warmer or red colors are representing uh, a community dominated by more boreal um, or southern distributed um, larval fish communities. And I color coded the years here just so you can also have an idea of which years we consider it warm or cold. So the main take home point here is that if we look at 2010 and compare that to 2017, the most recent year where we have uh, these data from, we see that there's quite a uh, dominance of this more boreal southern distributed community 
uh, in the northern Chukchi Sea. Uh, and if we compare that to two cold years, we see that there's a lot more blue, so a more Arctic dominated larval fish community. So that's just kind of set the base of what we're seeing in our uh, larval fishes. If we switch gears and look at what the ground fish group is seeing with their adult fish, with walleye pollock in this top uh, row, Pacific cod in the bottom row, looking at the years where they have done a northern Bering Sea extension, so this area up in here uh, near Norton Sound, uh, which was 2010, 2017, 2018, we can see how the distributions of both of these commercially important species is influenced not just by the extent of this cold pool that Phyllis mentioned, kind of here outlined um, in this kind of hot pink color, uh, but we can also see that as that cold pool um, is um, being reduced, where we see these kind of adult distribution shift. So mainly if we just look at 2010 for both walleye pollock and Pacific cod, we can see at the highest densities um, for especially pollock were on the kind of outer shelf denoted by this really um, deep purple color. Whereas for Pacific cod, somewhat along the um, outer shelf in the deep blue, but also in this Bristol Bay area. Whereas in 2017 and 2018, with this severe reduction in the cold pool to where in 2018 it's not even in our survey area, we see this really large increase in movement of these adult fishes, both walleye pollock and Pacific cod, into this northern Bering Sea area. So again, these are just some of the things that we've seen most recently. For the ground fish um, program, they, as I mentioned, they're out there sampling right now, and they are doing this northern Bering Sea extension. So later in the fall, once the surveys have ended and some preliminary analyses have been done, uh, the 2019 data will be shared uh, to a larger audience. So we'll get to kind of see that update, uh, hopefully in early in the fall. Uh, just to let you guys know, it's not like you want to know what other work was field work was planned in this area. So just to give you an idea, uh, this year the Recruitment Process Alliance has uh, kind of three different large programs that will be um, both in the Chukchi Sea as well as in the Northern Bering Sea. We're uh, participating in the DBO or the Distributed Biological Observatory in August, as well as this large-scale Arctic Integrated Ecosystem Research Project, um, which will extend from August into early October. Uh, denote it kind of by these red points in the map, and then also a Northern Bering Sea Survey that is a um, collaborative project with the Alaska Fishery Science Center and the Alaska Department of Fish and Game in these uh, blue dots in the Northern Bering Sea. And I have here listed the various ecosystem measurements we'll be taking, uh, just so you have an idea of what data are going to be collected while we're out there. And so with that, that was everything I wanted to share. Thank you so much, Ali. Um, does anyone have any questions for her? Um, so we have a question on the chat from Toby Nengazak. Uh, where can we find when the phytoplankton bloom in the, is in the Bering Sea? Um, they have concerns about PSP, um, especially in the Northern Bering Sea. Does anyone know who you can talk to about it? Well, and I see Carol has uh, supplied some answers. So some of that can be found with the mooring data. So I'm reading basically what Carol wrote. Sorry about that. Um, also, um, in addition to the folks at uh, the Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory, um, I know Lisa Eisner is very involved with a lot of the primary production work. Um, and I think sh um, when Ed introduced himself, she's there as well on the phone. This is so Phyllis? Kind of yeah. Okay, so M2 has a real-time mooring, and we saw a very nice early bloom, uh, kind of uh, Mayish, which is typical when you don't have ice on the southern shelf, a little bit earlier, a few days earlier, but basically very, very typical. Um, M8 last year in 2018 was shocking. It was a classic phytoplankton bloom at M8, and we've never seen that. We have 14 years of data there and we've always seen ice algae blooms, which 
fall as the ice melts and you can see it going by the fluorometer as it, and you get kind of a spiky bloom from the fluorometer. Uh, but it was a real classic uh, phytoplankton bloom, lasted about two and a half, three weeks. Um, but we don't have any knowledge of what species those might have been, huh, Phyllis? No, we don't have any knowledge. Uh, uh, Lisa might have a feel for some of it, uh, but we, I don't, we weren't up there during the bloom. There's no crews up there in June. That's why the moorings are so helpful. Gotcha, thank you. Um, Allison, one more question for you from Amy on the chat. Um, they're hearing that cod is being caught in crab pots in Norton Sound. Do you know anything about that? Um, so for this year, I won't comment on 2019 uh, just because those data, they're still out there collecting. Um, but I mean, from what we've been seeing, at least in 2017 and 2018, there has been what's been documented by the ground fish group, a movement of uh, Pacific cod into those areas, particularly Norton Sound as well. So I would not think it's surprising. Was there more that Amy wanted to hear to that or? Allison, this is Amy. No, I just wanted to um, see if you had anything you wanted to speak to that since we're hearing from the straight area about things like that. And I'm hoping mm -hmm. somebody will also talk from that region also talk about the extremely warm uh, river temps they're seeing and some die off of salmon. Okay, yeah, so I'd say stay tuned. Um, uh, probably October ish of this year. Um, our goal is to uh, the ground fish will have, they'll be back, the survey will be done, they'll be able to analyze some of that data and have some um, preliminary findings from this year's time. But right now we don't have any observations. They're not up there until August. Okay. Hey, thanks, Allison. And I just wanted to add in here, if anybody has anything um, they'd like to share in terms of, hey, we'd like you to keep a lookout on this, uh, I know, uh, I think there's going to be that ask from the marine mammal community with regard to the gray whales and maybe some others. Uh, and also in Bristol Bay last year, there was some weird acting polyp. And so there was an ask uh, to have fishermen and other researchers uh, take a look and report things in. From the fishery side of NOAA, uh, would you guys, is there any ask you have of the community? Ooh, I'm not necessarily where, one's not jumping to my mind. We had a few different ones, but they're more, from my memory, more like seabird related, marine mammal related to kind of document some uh, changes or observations. I know there's a, uh, there's a number of various citizen science ones. Uh, one of the things I tell uh, kind of the indigenous or the native native communities or people living up in Alaska that wanted to kind of share their their findings would be to contact uh, Gay Sheffield with um, NOAA Sea Grant. I think she's based in uh, in Nome, and she was just here a couple um, like a month or so ago. And she does a really great job of collecting and sharing the observations that are shared with her. So that's at least one um, avenue to take. Thank you for that, Allison. Um, I think now we'll switch over to Heather uh, to get an update on the seabirds. Thanks. So this is Heather Renner. I'm with the Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge. Um, trying to figure out how to share my screen. One second. Here we go. Um, So we at the Maritime Refuge do mostly land-based monitoring of seabirds on their colonies, um, but I've got a little bit of information also from our Migratory Birds Management Office. Rob Taylor's on the line today, so he can jump in if um, I get anything wrong or if he wants to add anything. And I've also got a little bit of information from COAST, which is a citizen science um, beach bird monitoring program out of the University of Washington. Um, I'll uh, contrast a little bit with last year. So 2018, we heard early reports of all the anomalous conditions and 
we made a really big effort to get some extra surveying done. So in 2018, um, colony-wise, we were able to visit most of the big seabird colonies in the Bering and Chukchi Sea. Um, uh, the Maritime Refuge staff visited all these ones with pins on them. Um, that doesn't include uh, St. Lawrence Island, which did have some work done on it as well by university, and then of course the diamonds in King Island. But other than those, we were able to visit most of the big, large aggregations of breeding seabirds. Um, and 2018 was a very unusual year for seabirds. Um, one of the biggest um, things that you've probably heard about was that MERS failed to breed in um, that year at all the colonies north of St. Matthew. And we know that um, while some seabirds do this regularly, it's really unusual for MERS. We've got about a 40 year data set and we've never seen anything like that for MERS. So that was quite an unusual event. Um, uh, we documented a, um, a die-off at St. Matthew, which was pretty pretty large, but it looked like it was old birds from earlier than 2018. And then one other unusual thing from that summer was that red-legged kittiwakes were nesting on St. Matthew for the first time ever recorded. So they're typically much further south, um, closer to the shelf break. Um, also in 2018, we had a number of die-offs reported. They weren't as extensive as the um, big famous ones in the Gulf of Alaska from a couple of years earlier, but still um, uh, kind of a constant uh, input of information about die-offs in the couple hundred um, numbers um, up in the Bering Strait region mostly. And um, I'm gonna contrast that a little bit with this year. Um, so this year we are back to more of a normal monitoring scheme that, um, Pluses, the red pluses are colonies that we're going to have information at from this summer. And so far we have crews out just on St. Paul and St. George and the Pribilofs. Um, in spite of the warm water and warm air temperatures, um, I'm going to cautiously say it looks like a much better year than we've seen in, in recent years. Um, Kittiwakes are breeding and doing well. MERS are laying eggs and starting to hatch. Um, uh, slightly no, lower numbers um, than we've had before, but um, but but so far, cautiously, it looks like the birds are, are doing okay. Um, we've had a few die-offs reported from public um, that come into the Fish and Wildlife Service. There's a, um, a hotline number that I'll share at the end. Um, we've had just these four reports I've got on the screen here that have been that have come into the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, not massive numbers, but certainly some some information has been sent in. Um, and I also asked our staff, our uh, colleagues at Coast, and um, they reported that there's been some localized upticks from coasters on St. Paul. So Coast is a citizen science um, monitoring of birds, dead birds on beaches. Um, but really this year there's been nothing long lasting or of a large quantity. Um, Hillary said that she was just in Utsiavik and there was no sign of trouble there and that coasters in Nome and Kostabu are seeing basically normal numbers. So my last slide, um, we've, there's a hotline um, that's staffed by the Migratory Bird Management Office in Anchorage. Um, we've got a phone number people can call if there are um, unusual numbers of dead birds, no need to call in singles or, or small numbers, but anything that seems out of, the, out of the normal. There's also an email inbox um, if that's an easier way to report things. And so Rob Kaler and Kathy Kulitz, their staff manage that. Um, we get a lot of questions about collecting carcasses, and in general, we don't encourage public members of the public to collect car carcasses, and certainly not um, birds that are looking sickly. Um, agency staff, it's a little bit different. There's some different permitting things. Um, if they're fresh and if it's um, a significant number of birds, then we would be interested in having carcasses sent in, um, but really only if they can be kept fresh and if it's um, if it's a die-off of uh, more than more than five or so birds that are together. Um, Rob on the line would be the person to talk to about that and the, the contact info on this slide would be the way to um, coordinate about that type of thing. So that's all I've got, thanks. Thanks so much, Heather. Does anyone have any questions for her? Kelly, I'll start, this is Amy. Um, Heather, we we're all concerned with what we saw last year. This year seems to be some good news. Any idea on the difference between the two years? Um, I don't know. Maybe they had a better winter. Um, it was a little bit cooler over the winter time. Um, it's uh, it's 
early in the year so far, and it's possible that we will see breeding failures. Usually what the metric we report is fledging success. Um, and so now we're just having birds start to hatch, but they haven't been nesting. Um, last year, there was really none that, that laid eggs or, or very few and no hatches. So it's looking better. I can't tell you why. Thanks. Okay, anyone else? Uh, we'll turn over to John Bankston then with the uh, marine mammals. Okay. Thanks, Kelly. Let's see. Uh, pressure's kind of on here. Hit this green share button. Green share button, and then it'll pop up with a screen for you to select. Let's see. Are you seeing that? Yep. Okay, wow. Perfect. Okay, so uh, greetings, everybody. Uh, uh, following, you know, Alice, Alice, Allison gave a nice uh, summary of what the Alaska Fishery Science Center is doing on the fish side of the house. I'm going to try to uh, give you some highlights of what we do uh, with mammal, marine mammal research. Uh, I know time's short. I'm going to try to, though, looking ahead on the agenda, there, you know, the things about. Uh, observation efforts this year, how can we collaborate? I'm going to try to uh, focus on three points. So where we are working on marine mammal work, uh, what we're observing, especially in regard to change that we think we're uh, sensing, and uh, how, I, how might we uh, help each other across lines and across agencies uh, through collaboration. Um, where we work, this, this slide, just shows this is both fish and mammals, but it's to try to make the point or give you a sense of how uh, broad the geography that the Alaska Fishery Science Center covers. Uh, this is a composite of multiple years, but many of these uh, study areas are occupied every year. And but right now I'm just going to talk about what we do with pinnipeds and cetaceans. Uh, with regard to the high Arctic, or at least the ice covered part of the Arctic, uh, I mean, down south Bering Sea, Aleutian Islands, we're also looking at harbor seals, stellar sea lions, and northern fur seals. But up north in the ice covered areas, there are four species ring seal, bearded seal, ribbon seal, and spotted seal that we are doing our best to um, study. We do that through aerial surveys. Here are, here are some surveys that we've done in collaboration with our Russian colleagues. Uh, both down in the uh, Siva Kost, uh, 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 oh, get mixed up here. Stand by, push the wrong button. No, oh. wrong button. Here we go. Over in the Siva Kost, the Bering Sea, and then. Um, more recently in the uh, Chukchi and the East Siberian Sea, we're planning to move over to the west in the Beaufort uh, Sea into Canadian waters with Canadian colleagues next year. Those uh, uh, aerial surveys give us a sense of the distribution and abundance of those four species. Here, for example, are uh, uh, a picture of densities of bearded seals in the Bering Sea. We don't really have any information on trend yet. This, this effort is to give us uh, the first credible abundance estimates of these ice-associated seals when we hope to cycle back through as we're able back and do the Bering Sea again here in some years, that will start to give us an idea of how the sea ice changes that are so dramatic that we're watching uh, to the extent to which they may have influenced the uh, change in abundance, uh, then we'll have trend. So that's what we're doing with aerial surveys. That's a big part of our work. We also handle seals. Uh, through by capturing and, and sampling them, the, I'll get an idea of their ecology. Uh, you know, how are they diving? What part of the water column are they using? Their seasonal movements, habitat use, that's through uh, satellite uh, telemetry. We gather uh, different types of samples to look at uh, genetic stock structure, pathology, diet, uh, health and condition. 
and some other metrics to help uh, assess what kind of uh, impacts there might be from uh, changes in the climate. I picked out a couple of examples for these uh, seals uh, that show some of the things that we have seen in recent years. Uh, this shows, you can see uh, Alaska on the uh, right here and, and uh, Russia on, on the left. In, in 2014 and 2016, here was the sea ice distribution in April. And this was the area in the marginal ice zone that we were working in those two years. This is an example of, of what we were doing with uh, ribbon seals. Contrast that with 2018. Here, here is where we were in 14 and 16. In 18, you can see our cruise track looking all over, finding bits and pieces of ice. We finally ended up here in uh, Norton Sound looking around. And that's quite a, a difference uh, uh, in uh, uh, you know, the distribution of the marginal ice zone where ribbon seals uh, do their puffing. Uh, it, we under, we're on the impression that's the lowest year on record for this uh, region uh, since the 1850s. If you look at where ribbon seals would be puffing, they're normally in that zone that we're showing as green. And down in 2014 and 2016, that's where we were seeing them. In 2018, with the change in ice, uh, we ended up here looking, but everywhere we looked, I'll say here, we're, we're wondering where did, where, did this, where did the pumping effort go? When we went up here, this area, and everywhere we looked along the coast, in coastal waters, and in talking to hunters, nothing, no ribbon seal pups or records of them at all in 2018. We've had some contact with our Russian colleagues in the western Bering Sea and no report of ribbon seals over there, although I have to say that's, that's not a comprehensive survey, but it's more of a question mark, which leads us to wonder what happened in 2018 to the cohort of ribbon seal pups born. That's a, a, a concern to us. If these uh, warm years continue, and that seems to be the trend, uh, what impact will that have on these populations? That's the ribbon seal pupping example. Another example is with spotted seal pups. Here we're looking at four, four years to contrast, 2014 through 18, uh, three sample years. This is a very small sample size, but we looked at the body condition of spotted seal pups that we handled out in the ice, as well as the blubber thickness of those pups. In other words, how, how fast are they growing from the the milk that uh, their mother's delivering. And both, both of those metrics were uh, declining and uh, uh, in a significant way. So that, that uh, also is a uh, change that we've seen and are, are intending to watch. These are sort of preliminary uh, results, but I'm sharing what uh, uh, we've found. The, this ice seal work is being done by Peter Boving's group at the Marine Mammal Lab. And Peter's on the phone, I think, still. So if I'm saying something wrong, Peter, if you have anything to add, uh, feel free to chime in. Uh, last thing I was going to mention with changes uh, in uh, 2019 so far, there's been an unusual mortality event with uh, 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 seals in Alaska, ice-associated seals in Alaska. It's called a UME. Uh, there had been an ongoing UME from 2011 to 2016 in Alaska, uh, and that was declared over, but it seems like uh, this is either a continuation or a new one of that, but that's something else that's uh, happening right now. So I know there are reports, and some of you that are out on cruises or working in uh, coastal communities may uh, uh, be encountering some of these reports. And uh, we can come back to uh, uh, what to do about that if you do get in that situation. Those are some pinniped examples. Turning to uh, cetaceans, uh, we study abundance and distribution using aerial surveys, ship surveys, acoustics, stock structure life history, 
uh, and habitat use and different types of process studies. A couple of examples that uh, I'm going to mention here uh, pertain to our acoustics work. We have long-term moorings out a Catherine Birchock's group in our cetacean program uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, other groups, many of you on the phone, PMEL especially, uh, maintains acoustic uh, sensors on some of these moorings, about 20 in her network. Um, and we also use um, uh, short-term deployments of, of not unmoored uh, gear to get a sense of where our whales through uh, uh, you know sensing their calls, two changes that we've sensed over the in recent years. Here's a in the last decade for bowhead whales, for example. You can see on in the left panel uh, here are some mooring locations where there are acoustic records. Um, bowhead whales appear to be spending more time north of Bering Strait in recent years. This this uh, area in the green circle geographically uh, sort of uh, comports with what we think we're seeing a shift of more uh, northerly uh, presence in the overwintering populations. Usually they're down here in the uh, Gulf of Anadir uh, and less down south of Bering Strait, which was a more predominant pattern in uh, a decade ago. North Pacific right whales, that's a very endangered uh, Species of large whale, perhaps, well, probably the, the uh, most endangered in the world. There are about 30 left. Uh, we mostly know them from this area down in Bristol Bay, Southeast Bering Sea. But uh, the acoustic records, plus sightings from uh, ship surveys, like this one uh, shown in dots, indicates that the uh, presence of North Pacific right whales on some of these um, uh, moored rays, we're seeing a more northerly uh, pattern in recent years, standing farther north out of uh, Bristol Bay and up around St. Lawrence, uh, and maybe even up toward Bering Strait. Let's see. Last uh, cetacean uh, comment I was going to make is there's also a gray whale unusual mortality event that's been occurring along the west coast of North America, uh, Alaska to Mexico, where whales are washing up, uh, probably many of you have heard, on many of those coastlines. Um, and those, many of those, the majority of those gray whales spend the summer feeding up here in the Chukchi Sea, where these green dots are. Um, and then and then migrate down to uh, 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 Mexico, Baja California. And um, one of the studies that we have are these ASAM, Arctic Sur Aerial Surveys of Arctic Marine Mammals, which we've been doing. This is a time series of about 39 years, not looking at just gray whales, but uh, bowhead whales, blue whales, and others. And through those surveys, we are getting sightings uh, of gray whales up here feeding. This year, uh, we're planning to, starting this month through autumn, uh, take photos of, again, of those gray whales in the ASAM study area and compare those photos with uh, uh, ones from previous years uh, to look at, you can tell if the uh, whales might seem uh, emaciated or smaller to give us some clue as to what may be causing that um, mortality event. And I guess the last thing, well, I was, this is more about where we're working, where we might collaborate. Uh, next month, we're going to do an abundance survey uh, here from the Beaufort Sea into Canadian waters, Amundsen Gulf, and so forth for bowhead whales. And we'll be covering that area uh, uh, very carefully with uh, aerial surveys. But I was just going to mention, you know, both for the, the whale surveys and the pinniped surveys, we do a lot of imagery. So those of you who are interested in ice or ice features or other types of biota that you might uh, observe from the ice characteristics, we have uh, terabytes of uh, imagery that we'd be happy to share if that could help your projects. I think that's my last slide. Yeah. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thanks so much, John.
Um, so when will the results from the 2019 survey be available? From what survey? From the aerial surveys. For, for bowhead whales? Yeah, or gray whales, any of the surveys that you guys are performing this year. Oh, I can't give you a date, but you know, uh, we try to get that out right away, but uh, uh, any of these projects with mammals, it's a little different than coming back and, and uh, taking the, the data off from your CTD. Uh, analyzing photographs is very labor intensive. We're trying to move to machine learning, but often it's uh, uh, more than a year to go through those photos carefully. We are, we are automating that process and having some success with it. But um, you know, those, those results are probably gonna be out in uh, uh, a year hence, or maybe even into early 21, I would guess. Gotcha, thank you. Um, are there any other questions for John? Yeah, hey John, this is Amy, and this is for everybody else too, uh, as we kind of um, try to help each other out. Uh, so John, I think one of the things, um, understand that timeline you were just talking about, but sharing preliminary, you know, here's our gut feel of how things are doing. They're doing, they're doing fine, they're doing poor, they're doing great. Uh, so sharing that kind of information at the end of the season would be uh, pretty good. And it doesn't have to be definitive, but it can be like, hey, uh, we think there's something going on with this. So, uh, you know, that's something we're going to try to aim for here uh, by the end of this uh, around early October to be able to share with each other, you know, what our preliminary results were coming off uh, our surveys and so that we can help each other understand what's going on with the system as a whole. No, I get that, Amy. And, and we try to do that uh, through different types of outlets. Uh, through our communications group here. Uh, uh, Maggie Mooney Seuss is uh, on top of all of that. And in some of the science groups that we collaborate with, they are uh, Alaska Native Marine Mammal Co-Management Partners. Um, we do try to be careful. So we, we I hear you, we try to give a heads up on like, you know, what's it look like? Is it, uh, did we have any concerns? Is it good, is it bad? But we also try to be careful not to get into too much depth because uh, uh, those reports can be uh, sometimes misinterpreted or if it's a preliminary report that gets used, uh, especially when, when these are used for um, management, uh, uh, we, we try to be careful on that. So I'm trying to uh, uh, reconcile expectations that detailed reports will be coming out soon. We try not to rush them. We try to make sure that when we release them, they're correct. Kelly, back to you. Thank you. Um, so I think now, kind of in the interest of time, um, <laughs> there's a really engaging set of updates, and thank you everyone for that. Um, I think now, instead of trying to, to talk about in depth, like where everyone is going, maybe we can do um, kind of a quick round the table of uh, the PIs on the call. Um, so if you're if you're going out on a cruise this year, um, you know what, or I guess the other way around. Uh, so for the community members on the phone, like what sort of things would be kind of crucial to uh, what would be beneficial to communities to gather, for communities, um, for the scientists to gather this year as we go out into the, into the field. Um, so I guess specifically, um, you know, what would we, if we encounter kind of large bird die-offs, um, you know, Heather, I know you said that uh, it's not usually favorable to, to collect these things, but um, and I'm really glad that you provide the call-in line and maybe we can utilize that um, when we're on the ships. Um, but as far as like marine mammals go, John, if we do encounter um, say a dead whale or a dead seal, um, is there a way to let the marine mammal office know about that? Um, I can jump in. Uh, Barb Mahoney. Oh yeah, please Barb, thank oh. you. 
Yeah, I'm the acting um, remedial stranding coordinator for NIMS in the Alaska region. And um, you can go online, um, but we do have a remedial hotline as well. That's 877-925-7773. Um, what really works best is, um, you know, getting the date, the location, and a picture. Even if you can't identify it because it's been old dead, um, we can kind of work with that. We are tracking the uh, large numbers of dead marine mammals. There's been, um, we get the gray wheel, you and me, but we've had hundreds of um, dead ice seals this particular year, and that's extremely, um, uh, you know, that's that's much higher than we've averaged in the past, which has been averaging about two dozen. Um, so 18 and 19 have been really bad for ice seals this particular year. And as John mentioned, with the ribbon seals um, out in the middle of the sea, we, they don't generally get to shore. So we're not even seeing the um, dead seals, but we do have a lot of um, bearded, ringed, and spotted seals on the beaches here. So yeah, I mean, if people are doing surveys and of whales, and or they see floaters, or they see things on the beach, and you don't have time to get there, you know, if you can just take a quick picture and, you know, contact NIMS, uh, myself, this hotline, or, um, you know, anyone in the Alaska region will make sure the picture comes to the stranding network. And I think we're we're trying to do is is document the change, and we're getting a lot more information because of the concern by the local communities than maybe we've gotten in the past. Hey Barb, thanks. This is John. Thanks for that. I was I was fumbling with the mute here. What I was going to say is that's Barb because she's on the phone. Uh, would you say <laughs> would you say a, a couple of more specific words uh, to folks about what should they do if they come across marine mammal carcasses or, or and think, boy, should I take a sample of something because it might be helpful to someone for some purpose? What's the guidance from the Stranding Network or the Alaska Regional Office? Uh, sure, sure. So, I mean, we're always up for skin. If you get a freezer and a plastic bag, you can just store that skin sample. And then if you're coming through Anchorage or we can make arrangements for shipping, including COD, um, after you have you know, if you land back in Seattle or if you, you know, don't have time in Anchorage and you're back down in California, we can make arrangements to um, get those samples up here. But, yeah, it's, I mean, we'll, we'll take what people get, which is usually a picture and a date um, and a location. Um, but John's right. If people are, you know, sitting there with their knife wondering how to spend their time, we'd be glad to take some samples. Measurements are good. We have on our website the Level A Stranding Report that it gets a little bit more details. Um, people are using baleen for another, a lot of um, studies. Hard parts work great, like whiskers and claws, because you can get some background information and not worry too much about um, smell. Um, but, but again, if you're near a community, we have a lot of stranding members, even um, particularly in the, in the Barrow, Ukiavik area and in the Nome area and in um, Kotzebue. So um, if you're near one of that place, near one of those communities, we can get people on, get people out to it. If it's a very fresh dead animal, um, well, even if it's a seal and or particularly a large whale, uh, we have a stranding team that's mobile. They can fly out of Anchorage here and be there within one or two days. And just to just to be clear, I wasn't necessarily advocating taking samples, but I was asking you if if you advocate for it. Uh, and in, are, are permit permit issues for marine mammals any kind of uh, something that uh, researchers should uh, take into account if they're trying to take samples from dead animals? I can give verbals. So if if they contact the Stranding Network, you know, there's a few of us that have authorization to have a verbal. Um, a communication um, to to collect parts and also hard parts except for endangered species people can collect off the beach but you know um, and and um, and that only in those hard parts does not include um, I mean it does allow the collection of parts from um, the ice seals bearded and ring that are listed but um, yeah with the permits we we work with the folks to uh, make sure that they're legal as soon as we can or as soon as they um, collect the samples and we understand that you're in a remote place there's no cellular contact so um, get the sample and then contact NIMS when you have it and we can make that you know arrangement as well authorization as well thanks Barb 
Yeah, thanks for the clarification. I always forget that part. <laughs> Um, so for our PIs on the phone, um, from previous field expeditions, uh, are you anticipating, have you seen anything particularly of concern last year or the years before that you're going to kind of keep an eye out for this year? Feel free to jump in. <laughs> Is there anything that from the community that they would particularly be interested in hearing about? Okay, when all else fails, we'll go to the preconceived discussion questions. Um, so, in particular, there is a group being held um, on July 17th, the uh, AUS and Alaska Harmful Algal Bloom Network is going to be hosting a workshop for healthcare providers and community members. Um, so, for our, our seabirds and our fish and our, um, and our marine mammals, are these samples that you guys are taking, um, are they being analyzed for HAB toxins? Is there anything that we can communicate to um, the Harmful Algal Bloom Network to give to these healthcare providers and community members as far as what we saw last year or anticipate, anticipate seeing this year? So this is Barbara. And um, one thing we are collecting, and it can get to some pretty um, rotten but intact animals, uh, we are working with the uh, Northwest Fishery Science Center and sending them samples for HABs. And I, and I do know that Kathleen Fever is heading up to Nome and she'll be presenting information from the 2018 walrus samples that she analyzed. Um, she's got a bunch new, uh, she's got uh, many new samples from 2019 that she's just starting to work in her lab. So, um, so we've been, uh, for multiple years now, we've been coordinating um, with the with the HABS program, um, some of the com hunting communities have been working directly with her as well, providing samples from their harvested animals. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Barb. And, and hi, this is Rob Kaler, Migratory Bird Management here in Anchorage. Um, we are working. So one of the things I've um, been overseeing is the collection of, of carcasses of seabirds. And uh, once we get a fresh set of carcasses into Anchorage, I turn around, send them to the National Wildlife Health Center in Madison. They do the necropsy, uh, disease testing. And then if there's any tissues available for HAB testing, uh, they will collect those and then send them back up to Anchorage uh, to the Alaska Science Center, uh, also here in Anchorage. And so Caroline Van Hemmer and Matt Smith have been running a lab uh, testing different tissues from birds and then, um, and so any fishes that are also found adjacent to dead carcasses um, have also been collected recently uh, within the last month, actually. And this is uh, specific to the, the Gulf of Alaska region, so not the bearing, but um, all of those tissues that we are available, that we are able to obtain are being uh, tested for harmful algal bloom biotoxins. Thanks. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, I think we'll just open it up for some discussion. So if anybody has any uh, kind of like headlines that you'd like to report from what you're seeing in the field so far, um, anything that you've seen, please feel free to chime in. Kelly, this is Amy. I just want to reiterate a couple of the things. Um, and Rick Toman, if you're still on the line, maybe uh, you could jump in here as well for what you're hearing. But uh, the Rick, do I have it right that water temperatures in the sea surface temperatures in particularly like Eastern Bering Sea, or, sorry, Eastern Norton Sound have been about 14 degrees above normal? I know we've heard that um, from Gay Sheffield that the river temps in the rivers on Eastern Norton Sound are about 20 C, I think she said. Rick, maybe you can correct me here. 
And so they're seeing a salmon die off because that's just far too warm for them. So um, Rick, anything else you think we ought to share? I think he had to jump off. Okay. 20 degrees C though, that's really impressive. Um, I wonder if, and as you said, that's out of Norton Sound. Um, I wonder if that will have an, an impact on the blooms that we might see this year. Um, I don't know if... Yeah, take a look at in the chat. Rick uh, gave a link to some of the sea surface temperature information. Uh, it is astounding. Uh, it just kind of blows your mind about how warm the water is. And this isn't quite Arctic, but we're paying real high attention to it uh, because it may end up uh, the foreshadowing what's going to happen in Western Alaska in the Bering Sea. And Kelly, feel free to jump in with me here on this. Uh, from the harmful algal bloom community, it just make sure everybody's aware that in Southeast Alaska, they had um, paralytic shellfish toxins show up in their testing a couple weeks earlier than normal and at levels, um, the, the, the EPA threshold is 80 micrograms per 100 grams. Do I have that right, Kelly? Do you remember? Anyway, the, the, key, sure, number yeah. 80, the key number is 80 and they had them in the multiple thousands including up to 4,000. They put out uh, press releases talking about potentially lethal uh, and the Aleutians have also seen uh, testing at over a thousand in some places. Now Kodiak is still uh, not quite that high, but about, but still over the limit. They usually are. Uh, we're starting to see an uptick of activity in Kachemak Bay, and we're for I think the first time seeing Pseudonychia in Kachemak Bay. So these are all things that are um, raising the hairs on the back of our neck. Uh, and uh, wanted to know if anybody else had anything else raising the hair on the back of there. Hey, Amy, this is Renee Crane with NOAA. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. And I, you know, it's definitely something everyone needs to keep an eye on. And it's something, you know, we want to keep sampling. The crews this summer will be sampling that, um, looking more in depth at the early, you know, the early results that we have from uh, last year's crews. And then also next year in 2020, there will also be a Healy cruise to focus on HABs. And so, you know, we should be planning to have this kind of meeting regularly um, to capture what's going on in the Bering Sea before that cruise goes out as well. And then capturing it, like you said, in a sort of a, you know, brief newsletter type of thing in the early fall so that we can circulate that information to communities and, and use it at the AFN conference and other things as well. So. I'm trying to make this a habit and keeping an eye on things like HABs. Yeah, Amy, I know we wanted to get somebody on the line um, from kind of the shellfish side of things and we weren't able to. Um, do you know of any testing that's going on in the Alaska area of shellfish? Of uh, shellfish? Uh, so I think we've alluded to some of the things that are going on. Uh, we're looking for um, uh, toxins in both tissues of seabirds and tissues of clams, uh, marine mammals, uh, and trying to get uh, that where we can. There's an effort that Gay Sheffield is leading in the Bering Strait to collect some of that. In addition, as Renee said, we have a number of cruises that are still collecting water samples and um, uh, collecting sediment to see the sift there. If everybody didn't catch this last year, Don Anderson's uh, colleagues uh, found uh, off of, uh, in the southern Chukchi, one of the highest concentrations of um, Alexandrium cysts in the world. Um, there's some interesting information about why we think that might be. And there, um, so we are doing some testing for uh, water, but a lot of it is uh, clam and other uh, tissues are being sent down to Kathy Lafave. So 
If you're interested in the harmful algal bloom work, uh, contact Kelly, contact me, contact uh, um, Kayla Schomer, uh, who's working at Alaskan Ocean Observing System, and we'll connect you to more to the key people working as part of the Alaska Harmful Algal Bloom Network. Thank you for that. Uh, hi, uh, this is Bob Pickard. Can you hear me? Hey, Bob. Hi. So uh, I'm going to be on the, uh, the cruise this year on the Healy as part of that NOAA-funded program, and we do have a, a HAB component. Um, I do want to say, though, that the cruise track of, of that cruise is pretty much set in stone. There's a little flexibility, but it's largely set in stone. Um, however, um, Renee mentioned that in 2020, we do have a cruise that's actually dedicated to, to study HABs, and that's much more flexible. So uh, it would be uh, really uh, uh, informative for us to hear, um, you know, well before the field season in 2020, uh, any information that the community can provide about where we might want to target some of our measurements. Yeah, sounds good, Bob. Uh, do you have a time frame in mind that would be best for that? Well, the cruise itself is happening in August 2020. So uh, basically right up until the time we sail. Um, you know, we, we do, of course, we have a straw man plan. I mean, we had to write the proposal and everything, but there's a lot of flexibility built into it. So, uh, you know, right up until the time we sail, um, any sort of input uh, would be very helpful. The IR, one of, there's going to be a joint meeting, um, most likely at the end of July on HABs um, between a bunch of the different collaboration teams. We'll be having a report out from the workshop that was, that's happening in Nome in next week. Um, and so this is also something we can discuss there too. Stay tuned for more information on that. Uh, hi, this is Rob Kaler again with Mike Bird here in Anchorage. Um, and I just wanted to add, um, so John Pierce, who I think participates in these, these calls as well, um, along with folks at the National Wildlife Health Center in Madison have been doing uh, captive studies on birds. And the preliminary results appear that birds seem to be highly susceptible to low levels of saxitoxin. So not to uh, steal their thunder, uh, but you should definitely, and I'm sure you will be, but be looping in some of the work that the National Wildlife Health Center is doing with with uh, birds. And right now it was mallards, so not particularly relevant, or not not relevant, but um, a little bit of a reach to try to expand that to how it might be affecting marine birds. But the at least there's a beginning of finding out what uh, the LD50 is for saxitoxin in birds, which appears to be lower than it is in mammals perhaps uh, owing to their digestive enzymes. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. And there's a note in the um, chat. Folks would like, oh, there you go. You got it. Thank you very much for providing your contact information. Uh, just to let everybody else know, um, NOAA's Coastal Ocean Science uh, component is also looking into food web impacts of uh, toxins. And Steve Kibler uh, from NOAA in North Carolina working out of Kachemak Bay is looking at um, forage fish and others. Yeah, and there's a, another comment in the chat from uh, Jay Hooper talking about people in the Kuskokwim area reporting seeing large numbers of, numbers of dead fish in the river, uh, mainly salmon. Um, and also just the, the extreme warm weather and water temperatures are increasing mortality um, in, in people um, leading to some people having heart attacks. Um, and I know especially the elderly and the young are susceptible to those sorts of things. So this is a, a, a greater issue than just the kind of marine animal side of it. So we'll definitely keep our ear to the ground for things like that. Um, so this is kind of the second year in a row that we've seen these extreme changes in the bearing from my understanding. Um, if we, and I know Jim likes to say that we've kind of transitioned to, to a tipping point. Um, so if this is a kind of a new normal, are our current observation plans adequate? Um, would it be, it, do we need to, to shift uh, northward in order to understand kind of what's happening at the ice edge um, or where the ice edge used to be at least to understand 
some of the water chemistry, some of the, the changes that are happening at that level. Does anyone on the phone have any thoughts on that? Yep, this is Phyllis. I think Hi, Phyllis. we have to be careful. And like I said, the most extensive ice year we had was 2012. And six years later, we had 18 and then 19. And so there's a, a real question. Have we truly shifted or could we go back to another cold stanza? So I think we have to keep our measurements flexible in not saying, oh, it's going to be warm from now on and ignore different parts. I think, I think we do need to make a continuation of sampling the entire Bering Sea. Um, at least for the next four or five years, um, because I, I, I don't think we can say definitely that we will not have another extensive ice year. Yeah, thank you for that, Phyllis. Yeah, I think um, this is Renee. I'm, I, I think that you know, one of the advantages that we have is that we have some long-term data sets. We have Phyllis's measurements going back 25 years and this distributed biological observatory and North Chukchi integrated study that Bob Pickhart has been a part of, Jackie Grebmeyer and others, that takes a look at everything from the physical oceanography through to the benthic ecology. And I think that's an interesting question that you pose, Kelly, about um, you know, we've been going to some of these hotspot areas, the BBO is kind of based on those. And I think that we're seeing that there may be some need to sample, um, you know, it sort of extend some of those lines or maybe, you know, just take some samples from a few other places nearby um, to capture some other signals. And also, you know, we have ocean acidification, harmful algal blooms, and also uh, microplastics in the marine environment on our, uh, you know, emerging issues radar. And so, those are some things that we probably need to be thinking about adding to our sampling regimes. Um, you know, sediment traps and things like that that can collect things for marine plastics and understanding uh, what's happening in the Arctic with regard to those things. So I do think that you asked an important question about whether we should um, maybe add measurements. You know, we've got these long-term data sets and, and there are also some emerging issues that we need to pay attention to. Yeah, thank you, Renee. Um, so uh, can I chime in for a second? So this is Bob Pickard. So I just, yeah, I'd just like to, um, um, you know, uh, follow up with what Renee said. I, I think uh, a very striking example of that is we do have these uh, sort of monitoring lines set up. And it turns out that at least so far, the biggest tab signals that we're seeing in the Chukchi are uh, in between these lines. So, you know, we wouldn't have even seen it if we're just sticking to these particular lines. So I think it's really important for us to, like Phyllis said, you know, sample the whole system, um, but also continue to try to explore um, either geographical regions or go after particular uh, process studies or whatever to, to continue to um, enhance our knowledge of, you know, the whole area. Because who knows where some of these things are going to pop up. So we have to be sort of prepared to be looking everywhere as best we can. Absolutely. Um, and so the field season kind of largely focuses on this August to, to October range. Um, is there a way that we can kind of turn around the data faster in order to, to inform these communities as the, the ice kind of comes back in and what they can maybe expect for um, the winter that year and for subsistence feeding and all of those sorts of things? or at least being able to share the data more broadly. Yeah, I think that's an interesting challenge. Um, you know, some of it is the, I think that that's a good goal. And I think, um, you know, near real time is a, is a good goal. And um, someone also suggested trying to give maybe your sort of gut feel on some areas where you have you have a sense that something has changed or that may be emergent and you're looking into it um 
And, I, and then for other things, you do have to take the time. You get back to shore and uh, you have to get through the data. So I think an overall awareness of trying to get the results out faster um, to communities in particular where they might affect people is something to keep on the for forefront of our minds. Okay, um, any other comments or questions? All right, well, I wanna thank everybody for your time and your participation today. Um, thank you so much to our presenters um, and everyone who, who called in and contributed kind of came together rather last minute due to some other kind of pressing things but I'm really happy with the way that it turned out um, I I think Amy and I had this idea that we could maybe create um, you know a document like she did last year in October coming back after everyone's field season and try to get this information together um, in a, a newsletter type of format to put out to the communities um, and so we'd like to do that again. Uh, I guess we'll follow up kind of closer to, to then and see if we can get that information and figure out how to start sharing the, the stuff. <laughs> uh, any other thoughts? And Yeah, I, this is Renee. I really want to thank Amy Holman for suggesting this and Kelly Euler for doing the work to pull everything together and everyone who contributed and Took time to be on the call. I think we had a really good turnout and exchanged a lot of information with each other. So thanks everyone for participating. Thanks, Renee. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. Much appreciated. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Kelly, anything else? That's all. We'll all see right. you all in Thank October. You. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kelly, for coordinating. Thanks. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks.